looking at a number of other places, but we'll begin in Romans 12. The moment that a sinner believes the gospel, the grace of God, uh, he is instantly baptized by the Holy Spirit into the church, which is the body of Christ. And that is a scriptural designation in Ephesians 1. It talks about the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. A church is just a called out assembly. And all believers in this present age of grace have been called out of this present evil world. We've been spiritually assembled in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 tells us that we are seated together uh, with him in heavenly places. It's a spiritual assembly, but very real. Some people say, well, if you can't see it, it's not real. Are you going to tell me the Holy Spirit's not real? Can't see him. It's a spiritual church made up of all believers in this age of grace. That's why Paul considered himself to be in the same body with believers in Rome before he had ever even visited there. When he writes Romans, he had yet to go to Rome. And notice what he says in Romans 12, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, using the illustration of a human body, and all members have not the same office, so we... He didn't say, so you, as in this is limited to the local church. He's talking about the, the, the spiritual body of Christ here. So we, including himself, being many, are one body in Christ. Again, Paul hadn't been there yet, but he's in the same body with them. And everyone members one of another. So we understand the truth about the spiritual body of Christ by studying Paul's epistles. Because that's where it's revealed. That's where it's taught. But we also find a great emphasis in his epistles on the local church. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. A, a local church is simply a visible assembly of believers in a location. Paul, I counted it up last night, he used the words church and churches by my count, and it may not be exact because I did it kind of quick, 61 times in his epistles. 47 of those references are to the local church. 47 out of 61, the way I see the verses anyway. You can check that for yourself, see what you come up with. There's only one body of Christ, but there are many local churches. Look in Romans 16. Romans 16. Verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila. And this was a married couple that was so helpful to Paul in the work of the ministry. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, sacrificial service in the ministry. They even put their life on the line to support Paul's ministry. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. And there were many of them that Paul had started and uh, that were started through people that Paul had trained. Many churches of the Gentiles likewise greet the church that is in their house. And uh, so the local church, many churches. And by the way, some people today say it's not a right church unless you meet in a house. Well, when this was written, that's all, the, that's all they could do. They met in a house most likely because that's the only place they could meet. There's nothing wrong with meeting in a building because the church is the people assembled together, whether it be in a house or in a building. The issue is not where you meet. The issue is that you meet. Okay. Now, a local church is a microcosm of the body of Christ. A micro, I, if you don't know what that means, I, I got a definition for you, okay? A microcosm is a community, place, or situation regarded as encapsulating in miniature the characteristic qualities or features of something much larger. It's like a visible manifestation of the spiritual church. In other words, 
there's only one body of Christ, but each local church is supposed to be made up of believers who are in that body. So there's like a miniature, so to speak, a microcosm. This is where the body of Christ in the local church can live out uh, their faith and uh, being members one of another. In other words, it's God's will for us to be members of two churches. Okay, The first church you join when you get saved. The moment you're saved, you're in the church, which is the body of Christ. But then you ought to be a part of a local church. Look in Philippians 1. And verse 1, Paul and uh, Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. So there's two churches here. They're in Christ Jesus. They're in his body, the moment of salvation. But they're at Philippi. And they're meeting together with an actual order. There's bishops and deacons. That's the only two offices in the local church. So the first church you're, you, you join when you get saved, and then the local church is something you ought to join to serve the Lord through. Now, I realize you need to serve the Lord every day of your life as an individual, but we need to learn to serve the Lord together, working together as members of one body. It's God's plan in God's way. The best way, listen and think about this, the best way for the spiritual reality of our union in Christ with other believers to be demonstrated is in the context of the local church. It's God's plan. In other words, we can, we can talk about the doctrine of the one body, but we need to live out that relationship with other believers in a local church. Okay? Some teach that God is no longer using the local church in these last days, that it's gotten so bad out there that you just need to forsake the local church and study at home and just be on your own. Well, I don't think you ought to be a part of an apostate church, but not every church is apostate. There are still Bible-believing churches. I believe we have one right here. People who teach this point out that the church is not mentioned in 2 Timothy. I read a whole book on 2 Timothy. A guy wrote from this perspective trying to say, forget the local church. They said the church is not even mentioned in 2 Timothy. And, and, and 2 Timothy deals with the apostasy of the last days. But who did Paul write 2 Timothy to? The pastor of a local church. <laughs> Timothy. And... You know what? He's encouraging him to stay true and faithful to what he had taught him. And no, listen to these verses. You don't have to turn there for time. But in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16, Wherefore, I beseech you, be a follower of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Timothy knew full well the importance of the local church. He's the pastor of a local church. And Paul is writing to him to encourage him to stay true and faithful in that local church at Ephesus in spite of all the apostasy that was abounding. Um, also, I, I, I checked this. It was either last night or this morning. I can't remember which. But I was, I was looking in Titus. And in Titus, the, church, the word church is not used in Titus. But do you know what Titus is about? Do you know why Paul wrote Titus? The theme of Titus is the proper order of the local church. So just because the word is not used doesn't mean it's not there. It's taken for granted. Okay? It's not a good testimony. This is what I'm, where I'm getting. It's not a good testimony at all. For someone to go around talking about the importance of the one body of Christ, the one body, the one body, if they can't faithfully serve God with other believers in a local church. <laughs> it's kind of hypocritical when you think about it. If somebody goes around talking about how important it is to be in one body, one body, well, demonstrate that. Demonstrate that relationship with other believers in a local church. That's God's plan. 
In other words, the body of Christ is not just some floating, ethereal, mystical thing that you're not a part of. You're a part of it, and you need to demonstrate that relationship with other believers that you can actually meet with and see. Right? Now, the Apostle Paul was all about the local church. I don't see how you could possibly read his epistles and not come away with that understanding. He said in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight 28 that he was given the care of all the churches. So he wasn't just like a local church pastor. He was an apostle that wrote scripture and gave the proper order and doctrine of the church. And he, he had the care of all the churches. The Lord used him to start many local churches. He wrote nine epistles by inspiration of God to seven local churches. Now, actually, Galatians was written to a, a group of churches in the region of Galatia. But you, know, you get the point. Local churches is, is what Paul ministered to. The Lord used him to deliver the proper doctrine and the order for the church. And, and Paul never commanded that we assemble together. Isn't that something? There's no commandment to go to church. Did you know that? I let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> but you know what? He took it for granted we would. In other words, this is the age of grace. Paul did give some commandments, but he did a lot of beseeching, right? He just took it for granted that believers would want to meet together with other like-minded believers. And I think that he would have found it very strange indeed to hear of believers who didn't care about church. Again, you go through his letters. Just And, and again, understand this. I believe in the great importance of the body of Christ. Because that's salvation. And, and going to a local church doesn't mean anything if you're not in the body of Christ. But don't take, don't misunderstand our emphasis on the body of Christ as being some kind of, it's like people say it's either or, either the body of Christ or the local church. No, it's both. They both have their place. Paul said more about the local church than he did the body of Christ, if you check the references. So you certainly couldn't say Paul had a take-it-or-leave-it attitude about it, right? Now, there are sadly many believers who don't have an assembly in their area that stands for the Word of God rightly divided. Many people in the world today... And I, I think it's better not to go to church than to go to an apostate church teaching false doctrine, preaching a false gospel. I'm not saying go to church at, at all costs. I'm saying if there's a good Bible-believing church that rightly divides the word of truth, you ought to be a part of it. You say, well, the, there is one, but it's not perfect. Oh, it's not perfect like you. If we sit around waiting for everybody to agree with us on everything, we're never going to get anything done, my friend. It's so one thing to talk about Christian liberty, something else to demonstrate it. Learn how to get along with other believers, even though they may not dot every I and cross every T. Like we might. But there are those that I hear from them. I hear from them. In fact, I've been in touch with some here recently in other parts of the world. I'm not even talking about the United States, but also in the United States, but other parts of the world. They, they don't have a, a Bible-believing local assembly, and they follow us online. They listen to our messages. They watch our messages, and they feel like they're a part of our church. And we are in the same body, and we can have that, uh, that fellowship. And they are thankful for the technology to be sitting somewhere on the other side of the world and watch our services here. But I guarantee you they would love to actually be a part of an assembly, not just watch the messages, but be a part of it. We who have the blessing of being part of a Bible-believing church always need to be careful that we maintain a thankful heart for that blessing. Because if it's there's one thing about human nature it's this and the old saying goes familiarity breeds contempt we pr are prone all of us are we're, as human beings we're prone to get used to what we have 
and take it for granted. You know? And, and that goes across the board. You can apply that in many ways. You know, we complain a lot about our country, and there's a lot to complain about. But I'd still rather live here than most other places. And I still try to thank God regularly for the freedom I enjoy as an American. All right? You know, look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Here's an interesting thing to consider. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2, and oh, how he loved the church at Thessalonica, and he had to leave earlier than he wanted to, and he couldn't wait to get back. He wanted to be there. He wanted to be there and see them. He didn't just say, well, I'm in the same body, so who cares? I'll see you in heaven. <laughs> he wanted to be there. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 2.17. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. He, he had to leave. He wasn't there in presence, but he was there in heart. He had a great desire to meet together with them. But you know what? There are those that, sadly, in many churches today, as churches meet this first day of the week, all across the country, all across the world, there are going to be many that are present in body, but not in heart. So you have a thing where you got those who are absent in body but not in heart. They would love to be there. Then you got those who are there who'd rather be, not be there. <laughs> you know, if we could ever get that thing lined up right. Do you follow that? It's possible to be there and not be there. <laughs> and what's the point? The point is you go to church from the heart. All right? That's the way it, it should be. And by the way, a verse just came to mind. And there's so many. I'm not going to look at them all. We're talking about the local church because Paul said so much about it. But you know where they were called Christians first, don't you? At Antioch in Acts chapter 11. It says in verse 26, When he, talking about Barnabas, had found him, talking about Paul, he brought him into Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church willingly. Wanting to do this, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. So when you're in the right kind of church, there's going to be teaching. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. You notice how Christians is used in the context of assembling with the church? That's the Lord's way. That's what He wants us to do. Now... God does not want us to merely attend church. People say, well, you always talk about church attendance. No, I don't. I, it's not my desire for people to attend church. Does your arm attend your body? Or is it an important part of it? Uh, do you attend your family? Or are you a member of it? Church attendance is a religious thing. I'm not interested in that. Most churches have spectators, not members. I'm not talking about you unless the shoe fits, right? But I'm talking about generally speaking, you know it's true. Most churches, as they meet across the land today, they're going to be people who come in, they sit down, they listen, they get up, they leave, repeat. Come, sit, listen, leave, repeat. Come, sit, listen, leave, repeat. Spectator. Like, you know, going to a football game or something. You're just there and you observe. And, but there's no, there's no issue there of really being involved in the work of the ministry. And I, and I, and I think we got an exception to that because here, our church, we have a lot of involvement, for which I'm thankful. But I'm talking generally. You know it's true. They, there are people that go to church, and they may even go every week, but they're not involved in the ministry, and they don't even really know the people they go to church with. They couldn't talk to you for five minutes about the people in the church, other than maybe their name, and they can't even get that right half the time, right? 
I'm guilty of that sometimes. I'm bad with names. You want to know why a lot of people want to go to a big church today? So they can just float in and float out. You don't have to be involved. They got a staff. They got people paid to do it. And you just float in and float out. No accountability. No responsibility. But your conscience feels better because you went to church. But is the Lord pleased with that kind of approach? Now, I think that people here today on this rainy Sunday morning and our faithful folks here this morning, I believe you're here for the right reason. I think, I think you've proven that in many ways. But as long as we have this flesh, we have to guard against falling into the wrong reasons that so many people go to church for. I'll give you some of them. These are easy to remember because they all start with the letter R. Ritual. You know, that's just a habit. That's what we do at Sunday. Go to church. Mindless, heartless, ritual. Religion. And there are people that say they're not religious, but they really are. Because deep down, they're afraid not to go to church. They think they're earning God's favor and if they get out of church, they'll incur God's judgment. And if that's your mindset, you're religious, you're legalistic, and, probably, and you may not even know it. <laughs> I don't have to be here. I'm right with God through Jesus Christ. I just happen to want to be here. <laughs> right? Somebody said, yeah, but you're the pastor. I don't have to be. I don't have to be. I could do something else, right? But what I'm saying is we should want to be. Religion is not what God is using today. In Israel, under the law, they had to go to a certain place at a certain time and go through certain things, and that, that's religion. That's not what we're about today in this age of grace. Requirement. That's for the young people who have no choice. My kids don't have a choice whether they go to church. We don't. It's not an option. Right? Now, my desire is that they want to go. As far as I knew, they look forward to it every week and they want to go. But if, they, if, if Kenzie said, you know, Dad, I don't want to go to church, I'm going to say, too bad, you're going. Right? Because I'm the authority. Our kids don't run our house. I do. Colton was asking Christy something the other day. She said, you've got to ask your dad because he's the boss. He said, but you're older than him. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't understand why I was the boss. And Trish said, because the Bible says, and she was teaching about what the Bible says about that. <laughs> How about reputation? Some people, that's why they go, because what would people think if they didn't? All right? Trying to please man. Oh, I don't want the phone calls. If I don't show up, I know they're going to come after me, you know. I'd rather not be here, but i got to go. And if you go to church for ritual, religion, requirement, or reputation, or any other thing, that's not the right thing. It's not going to benefit you. And it's not going to please the Lord. And it's not going to help the church. All right? So what are the right reasons? Well, I'm, I, can, I can list a number of things, but I'm just going to give you two that kind of sum it up as far as I can tell. I mean... Uh, Trying to just sum it up. We can get real specific and go through some things in detail, but really when you think about it, first of all, you should be faithful in a local church because of relationships. First of all, your relationship to God. That's number one. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. We don't have to go to church in order to worship God. We should worship Him daily. We are seated with Him already in heavenly places. We have full and free access to God. Yet we know it's God's will that we assemble together with other believers. And I believe this. If we love Christ, we're going to love His church. What is important to Him is to be important to us. The Bible said in Ephesians 5, 25, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. 
I mean, you think about how the Lord looks at the church. It's His plan. It's His, it's his purpose. It's, it's pleasing to Him. Now, let, let me tell you something. You say, well, it's not a big deal. Well, God evidently enjoys believers coming together for corporate worship. Don't you understand that it's one thing for somebody individually to praise God on their own, and that's great, but when you have believers that can actually get along and get together and worship God together, God is much pleased with that. You understand? In heaven, there's not going to be one dude up there praising God. It's corporate. And You know, he is pleased with the corporate worship of believers that are endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, Ephesians 4. He, he gets glory out of that. We should assemble together first and foremost to worship God and to learn His Word. Church is not an entertainment time. It's a, it's a time where we come together in His name to sing praises to Him like we believe he's real and everything. And we want to hear what he said in his word and to know him and to, and look, we can, you say, I can do that on my own. I know that. But is it not clear in the New Testament this is God's purpose? It surely is. The right kind of church is going to put the Lord first, not people. We don't want to please people first. We want to please God first. And if pleasing God doesn't please people, then they can just be displeased. We don't meet here first for you and to satisfy your opinions about everything and your feelings about everything. It's not about us. It's about God. And as long as we meet around His Word, that's always good. We assemble first and foremost for His glory. But then there's this thing of our relationship with one another. Okay, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. See, we're not only members of Christ, He's the head of the body, we're members obviously of one another. And Paul is talking about the spiritual body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, but he's writing to a local church, telling them how they ought to carry this out and how they treat one another. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So using an illustration of a human body, comparing it to the spiritual body of Christ. For by one spirit... Are we all baptized into one body, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, whether it be uh, bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, and this is obviously not talking about the human body, because if your human foot starts talking to you, you've got problems. This is talking about the church, okay? If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not the body. Is it therefore not the body? If the ear shall say, because I'm not the, the eye, I'm not the body, is it therefore not the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Okay, every member's important, right? And people get all caught up in the particulars of what they do. That's not the issue. It's the fact you're in this body and God has a role for you and it's all important. He said if, uh, verse number 18, but now hath God set members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they the many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body. And that's got to do with division. Like 
that was a problem at Corinth. They had divisions because of their carnality. But that the members should have the same care one for another. Think about that. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and members in particular. I don't think I need to comment much on that. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Look, please, in 1 Timothy chapter 5. So you've got this concept of the body, which is true, a, a spiritual reality, but it needs to be demonstrated and lived out uh, in a local church and how we treat one another and so on. We're members one of another. So we don't want to just attend a local church. We're part of it. We're to be a member of it, a, a, a real living part of what's going on. Not only are we in the same spiritual body, we're in the same spiritual family. Paul said, you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 5, verse 1, rebuke not an elder. And here the elders is talking about an older saint, uh, a man, but entreat him as a father. And the younger men as brethren. The elder women as mothers. And the younger as sisters with all purity. This is in the context of the local church. That's why we say brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. It's a family. We're in the same spiritual family. And we ought to treat one another like that. And perhaps one of the reasons why that's a problem in some churches is because the, there's so many families today that don't even have the right kind of family at home. So they, they don't know how to have the right kind of family at church. There should be a very warm, loving atmosphere among God's people, don't you think? You know, and I know that some of us are more outgoing than others, and some of us are, have a warmer personality. And by the way, you can be a lost person and have a good spirit, so to speak. But you know what I'm talking about, a genuine care and concern, and just this, this there ought to be this uh, a living reality that we don't, we don't just come here and we're here and then we leave and that's it. It's a family. It's a body, right? Most visitors won't return to a church unless they really feel welcome. I hate to admit this, but a lot of people, they, it ought to be all about the Word of God, but for a lot of people, even if they enjoy the message, that they don't feel like, if they, if they feel like they went to a morgue that day or a funeral, <laughs> they're not as likely to come back, right? And so that's something that's very important that one thing about it, it's God's will that all men be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. So a, a, a spiritual church is all about gaining new people, not for the sake of numbers to say we have so many. That's not it at all. Because if we were going to go that route, I know how to do that. I, if you want numbers, we can get them. Trust me. But it's about the quality, not the quantity. But you want more people to be saved. You want more people to learn and grow. And if what we believe has changed our life, don't you want that for other people? And if people come in and they feel like there's nothing to this, they don't seem to be too excited about what's going on. Why should I go there? People sense that, right? And so, in a church like this, and I'm thankful, look, I know people do this, but we could all do a better job of when new people walk through those doors, I'm not saying be fake about it and jump on them and be over the top, but there ought not be somebody come in here and sit down and only two or three people carry a conversation with them. Right? At the least, we can shake their hand and get their name and say, I'm glad you came. At the very least... But more than that, if people feel like they have established a connection somewhere, they're much more likely to return. Right? And guess what? Everybody knows the pastor is supposed to do that, so I don't count when I do that. <laughs> people expect the pastor to do that. What they want to see is the people in the church do that. And that's something we can all do if we'll, if we'll not make excuse but just follow through on what we know is right. All right, let me, let me 
follow up with this last point, and that's our responsibilities. We, we have relationship to God and one another, and then in those relationships co comes responsibilities. What a privilege to know the Lord. What a privilege to be in a local church. Well, with the privilege comes responsibility. Church is not just about sitting around and enjoying each other's company, right? God's given us a work to do. Yet most people that go to church today have the attitude, especially in America, what are you going to do for me? You know, that's the wrong attitude. The attitude is among believers, and the church is an assembly of believers. Believers ought to have the attitude of being a servant. You know, servants don't need recognition. They don't need to be rewarded every time they do their reasonable service. <laughs> They just faithfully serve God and one another because they want to. And what a blessing it is to have that privilege. There's something for everybody to do in the church. Uh, and it doesn't matter what it is in particular. If you're a part of a church and you support the church, you know, that's always important. Sometimes people get hung up on, I don't get to do this or I don't do that. But there's something all of us can do and every member is important in the body. Besides, it's been my experience that the people that have complained to me about not being asked to do something typically wouldn't do it if they were. Uh, I've had that. I'm not saying everybody, but it's been that. It's been that way. I've had several people like that over the years that uh, you gave them something, and they just did nothing with it, you know. So the people that have the right attitude. They just get in and do it, man. I mean, they take initiative and they see a need and they want to meet the need and. No, no, the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury, but in all labor there is profit. That's what the scripture says. Look, please, in Ephesians 4, and we'll try to finish this up here. Ephesians 4, there is a responsibility for edification. And I mean, there's so many verses where Paul talks about the edifying of the church, and that's not just the pastor's responsibility. Obviously, if I get up and teach the word of God, that ought to be edifying to you. But it goes further than that. In Ephesians 4, he's talking about how the Lord gave the church pastors and teachers and so on. For what purpose? Verse 12, Ephesians 4, 12. For the perfecting of the saints. That's talking about their spiritual growth. For the work of the ministry. They grow spiritually so they can do the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Every member has a role to fill in edifying one another. And if you read on, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Till we all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Uh, that's why our emphasis is on Christ and who we are in Him. Not self-help messages to get you through another day. Right? Because if you get your eyes on the Lord, that's the very best thing you could ever do. Under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. See, we need to be rooted and grounded in sound doctrine. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now look at verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, Maketh increase. How about that? Living and growing organism. Okay? Not a dead thing. Maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. All right? So every member has a role to fill in edifying the others. Obviously, a, a pastor and teacher is going to help lead the way in that, but all of us can say a, a word to others that edifies them uh, to be involved in their lives and to care for them and help them. And, and to uh, uh, Paul said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Right? Our conversation among one another as members ought to be edifying, not corrupt communication, right? Edification. What a, and, and I won't turn to all these, but do go to Galatians 6. A couple more, and that is, you know, we have a responsibility in edification. We have a responsibility in evangelism. The Bible said that we're laborers together with God. The Bible said we are ambassadors for Christ. Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. 
Timothy was an evangelist as a full-time uh, preacher of the gospel going out into areas where the gospel is not being preached. We call them missionaries today. Uh, but Timothy was a pastor. But Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. You may not be an evangelist, but every believer should do the work of an evangelist. We should s spread the gospel. We should share the gospel. We should be a witness for Christ. And we can have canvassing and we can have organized opportunities. But um, the far most effective means of evangelism is when the believers in a local church are faithful in their realm of influence to give the gospel to those they're around on a day-by-day -day basis. All right? By the way, gospel tracts still work. I mean, I gave a tract to a lady at Dunkin' Donuts window this morning. She didn't slap me or anything. She smiled and said, thank you for this. Thank you for this. And our tracts are very short and simple, and I guarantee you most of the time when you give one to somebody, they're going to read it. It only takes a minute to read, and there's the gospel right there. Evangelism, bearing one another's burdens, uh, Galatians 6, verse 2, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to love one another as he has loved us, as it's taught in the book of John, I believe it was at chapter 15 or 13. He talked about loving one another as he has loved us, sacrificially so. Um, bearing one another, now he goes on in the context to talk about there are times you've got to bear your own burden, your own responsibility. But the burdens of life, being a part of a church family that people care and they pray and they help in any way they can, that's a blessing, right? And I believe we have that here. But we just got to remember that it's not just about us and our burden. It's about everybody else's burden, right? And, and we need to bear one another's burdens. And look down in verse 6. Here's another responsibility. Let him that is taught, Galatians 6, verse 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. And if you compare that with Philippians 4, you find out that's talking about giving. Now, we should all have a part in supporting our local church. It costs money to operate a local church. <laughs> and it costs money to support missionaries. And if we're going to put our money toward anything, it ought to be the Lord's work. Of course, we're not under the law of tithing. We, we're very clear on that when we teach. I don't teach tithing, and I don't know anybody today that does, by the way, teach it according to the, the law of Moses and all its detail. But I don't have any problem with a, looking at a tenth as being a good principle to start with in terms of willingly, cheerfully giving 10%. But when you tell people, if you don't pay your tithe, God's going to curse you, sorry, but Paul said Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. I can't be cursed by the law. I'm in the body of Christ. But Paul plainly taught that we are to be grace givers, uh, giving cheerfully, right, and willingly according to what we have. Um, why would believers under grace give less to support the Lord's work than Israel was required to do under the law? Uh, when, when Paul talked about grace, did, what did that do for him? Did that make him do less than the other apostles? He said, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. He said, he said I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Mark these references down, I, and I'm not going to look at them for fixing the clothes, but if you want to know the right view of giving today, mark down these references. Acts 20, verse 35, it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's what Paul said, Christ said. Romans 15, verse 26 through 28, he talks about giving being a fruit of the Christian life. Romans 15, 26 to 28 1 Corinthians 9, the, the first part of that chapter, about verse 1 to 14, he talked about the Lord has ordained that they which preach the gospel live of the gospel. Paul made himself an exception because of his particular situation, but he said, in general, this is the way the Lord's ordained it. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, he talked about a collection. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, both chapters, is all about giving. 
Galatians 2.10, giving to the poor. Galatians 6, verse 6 through 10. By the way, in the context of be not deceived, God is not mocked, for what's for man so with that shall he also read. He's talking about giving in the context, if you check those verses. Ephesians 4.28, he said you ought to work with your own hands so you can give. <laughs> Philippians 4, verse 10 through 19, he commended the church at Philippi for supporting his work. Called it a fruit. Again. And he said, because you've given to me, God will provide for you. That's the promise. 1 Timothy 5, verse 17 and 18, talked about the elders that rule well, being counted worthy of double honor. Titus 3, verse 13 and 14, talked about supporting those visiting preachers that would be coming through, maintaining good works for necessary uses, being fruitful again. Look, folks, that's a lot of scriptures, isn't it? He never one time said you have to tithe or God's going to curse you. But he said you ought to, if the Spirit of God lives in you, there's one thing about God, he's a giver. Right? So, giving is a part of supporting a local church ministry. Now, here's the thing. People get in competition. Well, I don't have much. I can't give as much as so-and-so, so I just won't give anything. That's not the point at all. You give because it's right. I, I, it's clear to me. I mean, I, I can't fathom the mindset that says I don't have to give to the Lord's work. I, I just don't understand that. But it's out there. There are people out there like that. You do it because it's right. Now, it's not the amount. It's the attitude of the heart. God looked at a poor widow who gave two mites. He said, how much is that? Not much. He said, she gave more than the rest of these rich men. Because of the, the heart behind it. She gave what she had. And we all have a part. And look, when it comes to giving, the main thing is give yourself. <laughs> and give your time. And give in, in these other areas. But there is something about where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. And if a man won't put any money behind the Lord's work, his heart is not in it. And if anybody disagrees with that statement, after the service, come show me the verse where I'm mistaken. That's a test of, of a man's, what he values, what's a priority. Uh, and, I, and I believe we have a giving church, otherwise we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. And I thank God for it. But, but my point is, all of this is important. All of it is necessary. If everybody just gave cheerfully according to what they had, it would make a difference. It's not the amount, it's the attitude. You do it as unto the Lord. Paul said, God loveth a cheerful giver. Well, one other thing, and I can go on, but we'll have to finish with this. He talked about prayer, and that is a great responsibility. In, in Colossians 4.12, he said, um, Epaphras, who's one of you, he was a part of that church at Colossae, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Uh, they, we're our, we are complete in Christ, as he says in Colossians 2.10, as to our standing. But he's talking about in our daily walk that we would grow. Uh, I, hope and, I hope that every one of you prays with sincerity for each person in this church to grow spiritually and the Lord to do a work in our lives. And I hope that you pray for each individual by name with sincerity, not just God bless our church. You have a responsibility to pray. Prayerlessness is sin. Right? That, God's word is clear about the need to pray. And so sin is not just the wrong things we do. It's the right things we fail to do. These are things we all have a part in. You notice how general I am. Every one of us can do the things I just mentioned. Every one of us can have a part in edification, can have a part in evangelism, can have a part and bearing burdens, can have a part in giving, can have a part in prayer. All that's necessary to support the work of the local church. You may not have a position, you may not be the preacher, or you may not be a deacon, but every one of us can do the things that were just mentioned. 
Now, here's my question to you as we finish. There was a song we used to hear on our radio station down in Florida. It was kind of a cheesy song, but had a good message to it. What kind of church would my church be if every member were just like me? Think of that. That's kind of a, I mean, that's a good thought. You know, there are people that they always sit, they sit back with their critical spirit. They sit back with their critical spirit and they don't do this and they don't do that. And somebody needs to do this. And why doesn't, you know, and you got all these brilliant ideas. <laughs> then do it. <laughs> right? Right? That's how we need to be. In other words, we're, this is not a brainstorming session where we talk about what we ought to do. It's something we just do. And if it, would that, let me ask you this as we close. Something to think about, personal responsibility. If every member was just like you, could we keep the doors open? If every member was as faithful as you, could we keep the doors open? If every member prayed as much as you do for the other members, could we keep the, if every member gave what you give, could we even function? If every member witnessed as often as you do. You see how I'm saying? We, I take responsibility. I have a responsibility as a pastor, right? But we all have a responsibility as members of a church. And we've got to get out of the mode of spectating, right? And attending. Now, I don't think we really need this today. Honestly, I think we've got a good church. But I know this. It doesn't happen by accident. And if you don't have preaching like this, it won't stay a good church. I know what I'm doing. You know, I've always been amazed with people who've never pastored, have never preached, have never done that, but they know how it ought to be done. You know, that'd be like, I'm not a, a, a mechanic by any stretch. That'd be like me going down to the garage to the mechanic and say, don't do that. That's not how you, that's not how you fix that. Well, then you fix it. I don't know either. <laughs> Preventative. We have a good church. We're on the right track. But if we put it in cruise control and just let it go, it'll go the wrong direction every time. All right? If anybody ought to be excited about church, it ought to be us since we have a pure word of God and the gospel of the grace of God. And we know something about rightly dividing the word of truth, which is, which is the answer that people need. People are in such confusion and discouragement. And they're, they're, they're out there waiting for somebody to give them the answer. We have the answer. And we say, well, you get our little feelings hurt about something that don't matter in eternity. Right? I don't, you say, who? I don't know. I just know how people are. I mean, it's going to happen, you know. Right? we got to keep our mind and heart on the big picture of what it's all about at all times. Let's stand together, please.